We're all here by the grace of the Lord, aren't we? We don't deserve to be here. God has been so good to us and to our family. Yeah, so just to reminisce a few minutes, I guess since I hit 50, I've been reminiscing a lot more. <laughs> I just had a grandbaby, Daniel and I just had a grandbaby. We can't believe it. Our son was born right here. We, we pastored in South Florida and then came here in 1998. Our son was born in 1997 here in, no, down in Boynton Beach, down in Boynton Beach, Florida. Daniela, would you stand up, my wife, in the back? And I have to give honor to my in-laws, Sal and Elsa. Would you stand? They raised an awesome daughter. <laughs> And so we, we moved to this area and based out of this area way back then, and our youngest son, our oldest son, Andrew and Macy, they had their first child just two weeks ago. So we're just, man, this, this grandparent thing is awesome. <laughs> you can hold them and love them and then give them back. <laughs> and they have to stay up all night <laughs> watching them. Uh, just awesome. And then uh, our youngest son, Luke, he was de dedicated in this church with Pastor Hartman. Back in Daniela, what, 2002, right? 2002, he was dedicated here. We have lots of history here. Uh, you, you all have been supporting us in our missions work going all the way back to 1997 when we first went into missions. So spent 10 years in Pakistan. Uh, I joined this uh, organization called Global Initiative Reaching Muslim Peoples. We focus on reaching Muslims around the world. We do this through equipping the church to reach Muslims. So that means... We go into Bible schools around the world and do courses. We also do seminars with pastors. I'm going to show some pictures later of some of that. And we also do exactly what I'm doing this morning, preaching and just sharing in churches about how to reach Muslims. Uh, 70, I did the research on this, 70,000 Muslims in Tampa Bay area. 70,000. I remember way back in 1997 or something, I was flying from Tampa Bay, from, from Minneapolis to Tampa Bay, and when I got on the plane, this is way back, 30 years ago, got on the plane, and there was some Muslim people on the plane, and I said, hey, where are you going? What are you doing? Oh, we're coming down to Tampa because this is where our van evangelistic center for training is here in Tampa Bay. So I don't know if that's still the same today, but uh, there are Muslims to reach with the gospel. So... When you hear the word Muslim, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is either fear, anger, or indifference. Just leave them alone, let them do their own thing, and I'll stay over here as long as they don't hurt me. Or fear, some people are just afraid to walk to the other side of the street when they see them, or just indifference. You know, we're just going to ignore them. But uh, friends, we need to reach them with the gospel. And in my experience of all the missions work I've done with them, they're just like you and me in that they're just humans and they need to be touched with the gospel. Put aside all the Islam, put aside all of that, they're people that need the gospel. Put aside what they look like and just, just touch them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Witness to them. You might think, well, wow, I, they wouldn't accept the gospel. You would be surprised. You would be surprised how many of them are having dreams and visions of Jesus or different miracles happening in their life and they don't know who to talk to. I'm going to show a video right now of a young lady. She's, she teaches for our ministry. She came to the Lord in Dallas, Texas. And listen to this story about how someone in the church just reached out with the love of Christ and had such a powerful impact. Now she goes around the world and preaches. And just listen to this testimony. Could you run the, run the video? Muslims are desperate to have a relationship with Creator God. That's why they go to the mosque, they pray five times a day, they fast, they do everything they know right to do, but they are craving to have a relationship with Creator God. But they're not getting that in Islam. My name is Safiya, and this is my story. I was born and raised in Kuwait. 
Raised in a very devout Muslim home, when I went out in public, I always wear a headscarf covering, and I would always be accompanied by my father or my brother or my uncles. My parents did not give me a lot of freedom to uh, go and spend time with my friends or uh, participate in any school extra activities. I was always told to stay at home. For me, following the teachings of the Prophet, reading the Quran, following what Allah wants me to do and live as a good Muslim is what I was called to do. At the age of eight years old, my parents decided to go to Mecca and Medina for pilgrimage. So we drove from Kuwait to Saudi Arabia. We went to Mecca, which is this birthplace of Muhammad, and we performed a pilgrimage journey called Hajj. While we were going there, outside of the city of Mecca, we saw that a crowd was starting to gather. There were a lot of people, a lot of commotion, and my father and I got pushed to the very front of this crowd. And I see in the center of the circle was a man dressed in a traditional Arabic attire and next to him was a woman, completely covered. You could not see her face, her hands, or her feet. She was also tied up. And this man did a traditional Islamic prayer called Salat prayers. And then he got up and he pulled out a very long golden sword and he beheaded the woman. The men were chanting, Allahu Akbar, and the women were screaming and crying. And I pulled my father's hand and I said, Father, Father, what is happening? And my father said, Sophia, we're trying to raise you in a devout Muslim home. If you don't listen to the teachings of the Prophet from the Quran, if you don't live as a good Muslim and die as a good Muslim, this is what will happen to you one day. From that day on, I was instilled with fear. I always feared Allah. When we went back home to Kuwait, my parents enrolled me in an Islamic school where I learned more in-depth teachings from the Quran and the Hadith. I even entered a competition, and it's very prestigious to enter a competition where you learn a long chapter, a surah from the Quran, and I came second place. And I thought I did a good job and I was happy, but I saw that my parents were not happy and pleased with me. They wanted me to come first place. After that, they gave my younger brother authority over me, authority to monitor my prayer life, my fasting, monitor my time I spend with my friends. Even they gave him authority to hit me. I strove to please Allah, but I was not pleasing my parents. What was I doing wrong? Was it not good enough what I was doing? So I devoted my life even more to serving Allah. My parents always took my brother and I on vacation in our summer holidays from school. We have traveled extensively in the Middle East, but we never came to America. And I used to watch American TV shows, and I used to always wonder what America was like. So my parents applied for a visa for us to visit America in one summer holiday. And we were excited to come to a new country and visit this new culture and a new life. While we were in Texas spending time with some distant family relatives, we found out that overnight Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. At that moment in my life, I felt countryless and homeless. What is going to happen to our future? Are we going to ever get to go back home to Kuwait? Is our life going to be the same again? So we lived in America, and I'm living as a Muslim, and I remember I would drive by churches, and I remember people dressed very nice on Sunday mornings, and they would go into this place of worship, their worship with crosses on them. And I would always wonder, what, what are they going to? What, are they, what kind of experience are they having in these buildings? I did not know because I was not invited in one. I did this for eight years. I did come across Christians, but no one invited me to their church. No one even shared with me about their faith. One day, my grandmother came to visit me in America. I loved my grandmother dearly. I showed her my new life in America and I introduced her to my friends. One day, she got very sick and she had to go to the hospital. Two days later, she suddenly passed away. My family and I were devastated. We didn't have a chance to really say goodbye to her. And in Islam, when someone passes away, there's no assurance for their soul what's going to happen to them. It's all according to Allah's will. And at that time, I went to work for this company. I was working part-time. And this lady named Paula approached me. And she asked me if I was OK. And, I, and I, she could see I was visibly struggling that day. And, and I said, no, Paula, I'm not fine. My grandmother that came to visit me suddenly passed away. And I'm devastated. And I started to cry and Paula came and gave me a hug. I have received hugs before, but this hug was different. I immediately got peace. I cannot explain the kind of peace I got. 
And then finally, Paula said, I want to invite you to my church. Will you come with me? And I said, well, I'm a Muslim. I go to the mosque, but I will go to church with you. So I agreed to go to church with her that Sunday. And I walked into the church for the first time as a Muslim woman with my headscarf covering and a conservative outfit on. And I saw that people turned around and they looked at me and they had smiles on their faces. I will never forget that day. The preacher said, everyone open your books to the book of Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, he said, is a prophecy of Jesus. And the prophecy said this in the Bible. It said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom of sight to those who are bound. Who is he talking about? How is this book knowing about healing the brokenhearted and setting the captives free? At that moment in my life, I was both in my religion. And finally, after the service finished, I said, Paula, Paula, I have to know, what book is this from? And she said, that is from the Bible. And I've always been told that the Bible is corrupted and it's been altered and changed and it's not the true word of God, only the Quran is. But how could these words come out of a corrupted book? And I felt like I wanted to know more about this book. So Paula took me to the mall and she bought me a study Bible and she explained to me the books. And then I took it home and I started reading the Bible on my own. I didn't know where to start, so I started reading from Genesis. And the more I read this Bible, I felt like God was taking the veil off of my heart and my eyes. And He opened the blindness from my eyes and He let me see Him clearly. My heart was so overwhelmed with hurt and pain and distantness from God. But this God I was getting to know, I was getting to have a close relationship with Him, an intimate relationship with Him, and I was feeling love and acceptance by Him. I was overwhelmed by His love and grace and mercy, and I was no longer in darkness of Islam, but I was being shown the light of Jesus. Then one and a half year later, the pastor asked me if I wanted to get baptized, and I said, I would love to get baptized. Are we going to the Jordan River? And he said, no, we have a tub in the church. We do it in the tub. So I said, okay. So I was standing in the tub, and the pastor said, Sophia, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, Pastor, I had all kinds of doubts about him when I was reading the Bible, but today I believe with my whole heart that Jesus is the true living God, and he has come to set me free and he has delivered me from darkness of Islam. And I'm standing in the water, and the pastor said, when I put you back in the water, this is your old life passing away. When you come out of the water, you are a new creation in Christ. He said, God has forgiven your sins as far as east is to the west. And most importantly, what I've always wanted from a God is, I have inheritance in the kingdom of God. I've been a believer now for about 14 years, God has blessed me, given me a wonderful life. Uh, I did tell my parents that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and my father rejected me. And he told me he no longer wants to see me again. And during that time, God says, when your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will receive you. So God received me and he showed me the kind of God he was. My heart is to minister to Muslims and show them that God has come to save them and set them free from bondage of Islam and bring them into freedom to worship Him. Uh, I want Muslims to desperately see that there is hope for them. There's a future for them. My name is Sophia and this is my story. You heard some very important things about reaching out to Muslims. You heard about just expressing the love of Christ to them. You heard about them putting a Bible in their hands. People may ask me many times, what's the best way to reach out to a Muslim? I say, well, we can give some tracks. Tracks are great. But the best evangelistic tool you can give a Muslim is this. Right here. You have to read the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by. They need to read the Bible for themselves. They need to be. Uh, brought through the scriptures and show who Jesus Christ really is. You know, in Islam, it teaches them he's a great prophet, right? He, there's, there's miracles mentioned that he did, but they don't know the whole story of the Bible. So the best thing, keep some Bibles in your car, and if you come in contact with them, uh, give that to them. And then uh, I also think about uh, persecution that they go through, and it's going to take the church to, um, to welcome them. Didn't you love that when she walks in the church? It wasn't a bunch of people going, looking at them because they're dressed different. It was 
they smiled, they welcomed, because that's where they need to be to hear the gospel. Amen? Amen? How else are they going to hear? So I pray, this is for somebody this morning, maybe they're in your neighborhood, maybe they're at your work, you know, just, to, just approach them, ask if you can pray for them, give them a scripture, invite them to the Bible, see what God will do. Not all Muslims are open, just like not all people that you witness to, uh, out, even non-Muslims, they're not all open, but there are those that are open and ready to receive. Islam does not have an answer. That's right. It does not have an answer for the problems in man's life. Islam basically says, do more good works. Pray a little bit harder. Fast a little bit harder. Do these things and somehow you might please Allah and get to paradise. But Jesus comes to be our father, amen? He comes to be our savior, comes to be our friend. So I just want to challenge you. On the back table, there's some free materials, how to share your faith with a Muslim, what Christians need to know about Muslims. These are all free. We also have what we call Juma Prayer Fellowship. Every Friday, we fast and pray for Muslims. There's a card out there that looks like this. On the back, you can fill it out, and we will send you our Intercede magazine for free. We won't ask you for any money. We want you to pray first. That's the most important thing that you can do. So if you would like that free magazine, you can give your address there on that little thing. Leave it behind for us. And then if you're really interested, you have a Muslim friend, you know Muslims in your community, and you want to learn more, we wrote a book from our ministry. It's called Journey to Understanding, Equipping Christians to Engage Muslims with Faith. We would ask for a $5 donation just for the printing of it. So if you're interested in more, reading more, some of her, te more of her testimony is in this book, and it gives you practical tools of how to start conversation. It has conversation starters in it. How to, that Muslim at work or in your neighborhood, what's a good question to start a spiritual conversation? There's lots of little hints like that in this book. So please take advantage of those if, if the Lord would touch your heart in this area. So I would like to share from the scriptures this morning. If you would turn to Romans chapter 10, I want to share a couple of verses of scripture with you. I'm so thrilled to see uh, these posters up on the side of the wall here. We are an Assemblies of God church. Amen? We are Pentecostal, right? <laughs> we believe that God is pouring out his spirit in the last days because we believe that there's a great end time harvest coming in. That's what the Assemblies of God was all predicated on. It was not, the Assemblies of God was not started to be another denomination. The beginning of the Assemblies of God, they said, this is for the biggest evangelism of the world that we've ever seen in this last time harvest. So when you're around, if you're going to be in this church for very long, you're going to hear about missions a lot. You can see all 23 of their missionaries. I think there's 23 that I counted here. Something like that. 23 missionaries that they support, probably they give offerings to many other ministries. We believe in missions. We believe that we're in the church for a purpose. We're not here just to collect wealth and to sit around, right? Amen? We are here for the greatest evangelization of this city and of the world. And you're going to hear about missions. And I want to just share a little bit about, this is probably one of the, one of the famous missions passages in the Bible by the Apostle Paul. And, it's, and the Apostle Paul was given the mystery of the gospel. And what he means by that, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were God's chosen race. That was the line through G, which Jesus Christ would come. But the mystery that Paul was talking about is that, is there any Jewish people here this morning? Just to make sure there's a couple of you, okay? But we were grafted in. The Gentiles get to be grafted into the kingdom of God. That was the mystery that Paul gave, the mystery of the gospel, that we are brought into this kingdom of God. We're brought into this family of the Lord. And he starts to explain in, Rome, in the book of Romans about what this whole gospel means. And he gets to chapter 10, verse number 13, and we'll begin reading there. I think it's on the screen for you. It says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, 
How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of the gospel. Let's pray a minute. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul. Lord, I pray that you will let these sink deeply into our heart today, Father. That each of us in this room, if we know you as Lord and Savior, we have a purpose and a mission that you have called us to, God. You've called us to be witnesses, to bear the light of Jesus Christ to the world. Father, I pray that you would burn these scriptures in our hearts today. Speak to us through your word. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I would have to admit to you today that my feet are not beautiful. (laughs) Physically, they are not beautiful. I got some things on my feet that I probably you wouldn't want to see. (laughs) But here he says, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we were to look into the original language of that phrase, how beautiful are the feet, the word beautiful is the Greek word where we get the word for hour. It's a time word. It's like the hour on a clock. This was the best translation that they could come up with, how beautiful. Like something happening at the right time. It happens just at the right moment. I would like to paraphrase this phrase. Instead of it reading, how beautiful are the feet, how timely are the feet of those that preach the good news of Jesus Christ. You know that there's people right in your neighborhood living right next door to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Time is short, friend. Time is short. We're on a short timetable here. There's people that are dying and going to hell. How timely. It's been said by missiologists, the gospel is only good to those that it reaches in time. And that is so true right here in America or around the world. It's a timely message that we have, friends. We have never seen our world in such chaos and people so confused. They're even confused about who they are biologically. We're in confusion. And the only hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's the only hope for mankind. And Paul lays out in reverse order the process of salvation. In that passage of scripture there, and through verses 14 and 15, he lays out the process of salvation for people to hear the message of the gospel. He says there that someone has to be sent first. You are the sent ones. You are the sent ones. You are the called one. You are the called out one. You are the church. That's what it means. You are called out and sent to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So first they're sent. Then they have to preach. Preaching is still relevant. There's a very famous phrase that says, if necessary, preach the gospel, saying that you just preach the gospel by living your life. I would say that is not true. Somebody has to verbalize the gospel message and preach it or share it to somebody for them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. They can see your good works, the Bible says, and they glorify your heavenly Father, but... The gospel has to be preached. I pray, friends, that this church remains a missionary church. I pray that you continue to send out missionaries or you will die. You will. We have to be a sending church. We have to see the harvest field and keep doing outreach and sending people into the harvest field. So we have to preach. And they have to hear. The next thing, they have to hear the gospel message. We have to verbalize it. Whether we do that through preaching on the radio or verbally uh, preaching it or witnessing in our neighborhoods. And then there's a believing. There's a believing that has to take place. This word believe 
is not just a mental assent. I hear many times that people say repentance is just a change of mind. I don't believe that. From what I read in the Bible, it says repentance is a change of the heart. It's not just a change in the mind. The mind will be changed by the transfer, transformation of the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit has to come in. And He has to do that work of salvation, of grace, of conversion in your heart. He lays out the process of salvation there. Someone has to be sent, someone has to preach. Someone has to hear. Someone has to believe. This is the process of salvation. I want to challenge you this morning. Are we being good witnesses? Are we being beautiful, timely feet of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Number one, this is why I believe in missions so much. And this is why I've given my life, and this is what the church is called to be. Go to the next slide, please. Number one, I believe in missions because of the call of God. As we read the Bible from the beginning to the end, we see that the Bible is supposed to be read through the lens of Jesus Christ. From the beginning sacrifice to cover their sins in the Garden of Eden, all the way to the cross and all the way to the throne where it says the Lamb of God, the scars are still going to be in Jesus' hands. It's the story of Jesus and the redemption of man. What is our biggest problem today in the world? Is it poverty? Is it hatred? Is it prejudice? Is it violence? Our biggest problem is sin. And we get it from the first book, Genesis chapter 3, with the fall of man, we see it. The problem is sin. But God is calling from the very beginning, from Genesis the beginning, we see God walking in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve, and he calls out to them to walk with them and have fellowship with them. God is calling. God is calling you into an intimate relationship with him, to know him, to love him, to serve him. First, it's a call to Christ. He calls us into fellowship with him. He calls us to salvation. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, Now on that last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. Jesus is offering cool water to you today. Are you feeling thirsty? Are you feeling parched in this world? Get a hold of Jesus. He satisfies. Are you going through great struggles in your life? Drink some Jesus. <laughs> Get a hold of the living water of Jesus Christ. This is what they're talking about there. The priests once a year would take a golden container and they would take water and they would bring it into the temple and around the altar they would pour this water. This is what he's talking about. And Jesus says, that's me. I am the living water. I'm the one that can satisfy your thirst. Maybe this morning you're not satisfied with life. You're struggling in some area of your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's family members. <laughs> Jesus is the only one that satisfies friends. Jesus is the only one that can give you peace in the midst of the storm. I'm not saying all your circumstances are going to get right, but I'm telling you that Jesus is going to walk with you through any of those circumstances. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He calls us to Christ. He calls us in Christ. He calls us to be his witnesses. We have a purpose. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us with a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. And then he says he's called us for Christ. In John chapter 20, verse 21, he says, As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Each one of us this week, God is going to lead you to somebody that needs to hear you verbalize the gospel. He's going to bring someone to your path that you just need to open your mouth and you say, well, pastor, I can't explain the whole gospel. I don't understand it very good. It's very simple. Tell them what God has done in your life. Tell them how he has saved you. Tell them how he's made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Give your simple testimony. In John chapter 13, verse 20, 
It says, truly, truly, I send to you, whoever receives the ones I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. What he's talking about there is we are sent ones. We're, we're sent ones with a call from the Lord. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's a training I was at in Benin, Africa. You can see the only white face in the whole group. <laughs> I tell you what, friends, I wish I could have brought you along. These young girls on the front row here put me to shame. Their part, this is a mission school. We went there and did missions training, where they're training these people as missionaries to go across North Africa and be, be the witness for the gospel. These young girls in the front row, it, it just, it shook me up. They'd get on their bikes and they would ride for 20, 30 kilometers to go out to villages to share the gospel message. And we like to complain about little problems that we're having. And I thought, dear Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for taking the grace of Jesus Christ and what he's given to me and the freedom that I have here in this country they just challenged me so much about my dedication for the Lord and their call to reach people with the gospel. Just let those faces sink into your heart a minute and think about how God is going to use you and is calling you just like these people to preach the gospel in their lands. You can go to the next slide, please. Second reason I believe in missions and the beautiful feet of the gospel is because of the image of God. We're having lots of problems with racism and prejudice in these days in our country and around the world. But in the Bible, we see that everybody was created in the image of God. We're all created in the image of God. God has created everyone. He's created us with a purpose. He created us to have relationship and communion with him. He created us to have authority and purpose in the plan of God. Why is this so important? Number one, it means that we are all of equal value to the Lord. Friends, we have to be so careful. I know some of you have been in the Lord for 60, 70 years. I came to the Lord when I was around 18, 19 years old. I've been in the Lord a long time, and it is, we have to be so careful that we remain passionate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can fall into apathy, and we can forget the goodness of the Lord and the faithfulness that he's been to us. And sometimes we forget that we think we're of more value than that lost person walking the streets or that lost person in Asia, in Buddhism or Hinduism. But we're all created of equal value. The Muslim in Saudi Arabia, the Buddhist in Cambodia, the Hindu in India, the animist in Africa, the atheist in the university, the backslidden person in our own country, the addicted on the street, the humanist and the secularist and the atheist, they're all created in the image of God, and they're of equal value in his sight. He wants them to know the message of the gospel. And they're all worthy. Every person is worthy to hear the message of the gospel. You know, I, friends, I ask this question to myself many times. I'm sitting up here preaching this morning. I'm a farm boy from South Dakota. I'm from a small town of a thousand people. And I always, I, I still joke about this. I, I say this most times I get to preach like this, but I can't figure out why God called me. I really can't. Somebody must have really missed the call of God <laughs> that I had to be the backup because I don't get it. I don't get it. There's much more capable people. But what God is asking us to, each one of us to do, is to be faithful with the calling that God has given you. Be faithful with what he's given you. Because you have been given much, much is going to be required of you. We've been given so much. And, and some of you have such a rich heritage. 
Some of you have wonderful parents and grandparents that go way back. Some of you maybe are first generation Christians. We're blessed. We're blessed. All are worthy to hear the gospel message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number three, the third reason that I believe in missions so much. You can go to the next slide. They're going to get to it. It's because of the lostness of humanity. Let me make this phrase, and I want to be very clear. Hopefully it will be very clear to you today. There's a subtle lie that's creeping into the church. And it's creeping into missions work too. There's much talk about grace. And I believe in the grace of God. But the counterbalance is the wrath of God. It says that the wrath of God is poured out against all unrighteousness of man. Romans chapter 1. Read Romans chapter 1, men, when you go home today. And we see the lostness of man. And there's a subtle lie that's creeping into the church that, oh, God's going to have grace on people. Eventually, all people are going to make it to heaven. He wouldn't send anyone to hell. Friends, we have to be careful. This is not the message of the gospel. The Bible clearly teaches that there is a devil, there is a literal devil, and there is a literal hell. And what we do with Jesus Christ, man is lost. I hope that will sink into your heart. And I I say this with a heart of love and compassion as a missionary, because we're around a lot of lost people. But friends, let that sink in. That all are lost without Jesus Christ. They tell us in the world today, they tell us in the world today with all of humanity, all the people of the world, 80% of the world does not know a Christian and does not have a Bible. Think about that. We have much work to do. You've got a lot of work to do right here in Newport Ritchie. You have a lot of neighbors and people to share the message and the hope of the gospel with them because man is lost. He's lost. We have to be careful of the danger of what they call pluralism, believing that somehow everybody's going to make it to heaven eventually. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we're condemned in our sins. We love to quote John 3, 16. But we forget the following verses. John 3, 18 and 19. Whoever believes in me is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in me is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because of their works were evil. What a, what a sobering reality that puts in our hearts. And friends, when we read that, that should, that should fill our eyes with tears. Man is lost without Jesus Christ. And God has given us the hope of the gospel that we need to share with them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 says, You were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you once all walked in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, listen to this, this really cuts to my heart. Before we came to Christ, it says we were children of wrath, Like the rest of mankind. Oh, but verse number four, hallelujah. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses has made us alive together in Jesus Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Hallelujah. There was a young lady. Her name was Jennifer Rothschild. At the age of 15, She developed an eye disease where she lost all of her eyesight as a teenager. 
She did not mope and look down at this as a huge disability, but she overcame her disability to write 14 books. And now she travels the United States preaching the gospel. She's blind. Here's what she said about her blindness. And I think this refers to the lostness of mankind out there. She said, when you wake up every day in the dark, it becomes normal. This is where humanity is. Humanity has been in the darkness so long that they think it's a game. And they enjoy it. And they're deceived. But God, who is rich in mercy, he has loved us. Number four, the fourth reason I believe in, you can go to the next slide, is for the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel. What is your great hope? What, 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 do you, what, what gets you up every day and gets you happy? Or maybe you don't get up happy. <laughs> what gets you up and gets you happy? Is it, the hope, is it the hope of Jesus Christ in the gospel? What gives us hope as we look at our country and our world and the chaos that is going on? What gives us hope? It's the hope that one day Jesus is coming back for his church. With that same enthusiasm that you clapped and get excited about that, that's the reason why you should be involved in missions. Because there is urgency in this task. Along with the hope of the gospel and the soon return of Jesus Christ, we have an urgency about this. He's coming back soon, and we are urgent. It's the hope of our whole world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our hope. You know how Christians would greet one another in the New Testament? They'd say, Maranatha, our Lord comes. Do we believe that? Yeah. I plan for my retirement, try to save some money. But if the Lord comes, you could have my retirement account. <laughs> I've got much better riches laid up in heaven. Our hope is not this world. Our hope is not a better mankind. We want them to come to Christ, yes, but that's not our hope. Our hope is in the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's coming soon. We need to keep our eyes on his soon return. The thief on the cross, as he acknowledged it, Jesus was Savior and Lord. Jesus said the most beautiful words. I want this to be said of me when I'm on my deathbed. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Our hope is in the soon return of Jesus Christ. Our significance in life is based upon the size of the cause we live for and the price we are willing to pay to see it accomplished, friends. You can go to that next slide, please. It's there somewhere. Oh, here's some pictures. I got to show you some more pictures. This is my transportation in Africa. And we actually fit all of those books and materials on, on our motorcycles, two or three motorcycles, and we went. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> One more slide. Here we go. This was training in Bangladesh. I just came back from Bangladesh and Pakistan. On the left-hand side, this is a group of pastors. One pastor stood up and shared the testimony that they're seeing a great in-harvest of Muslims coming to Christ. He said he's baptized over 200 converts in his church. They have a great fervency and passion. My translator was a, a, a young girl, about 25 years old, and I got to talk with her after one of the sessions, and she just, just a great passion for the Lord and sharing the gospel. And just casually, she says, yeah, about a year ago, I spent two, uh, two months in prison because we were preaching the gospel in this village. Like, it was nothing. I'm like, wow, we would, we would be publishing a book in America if we had to go to jail for two months. We would publish a book. She's like, yeah, that's not a big deal. If you, if you witness for Christ here, you're going to go to jail. You're going to be persecuted. It wasn't a big deal to her at all. I thought, wow, forgive me, Lord. 
I'm afraid to open my mouth sometimes to share with people. Uh, and they committed, each of those pastors in that picture committed that they would uh, witness to at least 100 Muslims every, that year, each one of them. On the other side, this is Pakistan, where we spent years there, and this was in the Bible school there. Many of these are pastor friends, and uh, they're doing great things. They're being persecuted and having trials, but God is, God is helping them. So, friends, go to the last slide there, please. There is one more slide. We'll get to it. Oh, maybe that's the last one. We'll stop right there then. We'll stop right there. I know it's almost time. I'm, I just want to thank you today for hearing this message and for considering how God wants to use you in his kingdom. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. Would you bow your heads a minute? Maybe there's somebody here this morning. I don't know. Maybe there are some visitors here this morning, or maybe you've heard the preaching this morning and it's touched your heart. The word of God has touched your heart this morning. And maybe, maybe you're not sure about your salvation. Maybe you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that today. The gospel is very simple. It's the story of Jesus Christ and his redemption on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, and he's coming soon. And maybe there's someone here this morning and you've never committed your life to the Lord and you would just say by a raised hand that I just want to surrender my life to him. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm not right with him. I know I'm not in relationship with him. I know I'm not being led by the spirit of God in my life. And I would just like to surrender my life to him today. Is, is there anyone this morning by an upraised hand? You'd raise your hand and you would say, I need to surrender my life to the Lord this morning. Give my heart to him. Is there anyone? Is there anyone this morning? Yes, Jesus. Secondly, I would just like to ask you again, as the church here at Newport Ritchie, I want you to be involved in the Great Commission in taking this gospel around the world. I pray that this church will always remain a missions church. You'll get a heart for the lost. God is calling we're all made in the image of God. Everyone deserves the gospel. Humanity is lost, and the gospel is the only hope for our world. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for what you're doing in our hearts and in the world. We thank you, Lord, for this harvest that we are seeing coming in around the world. I pray, God, that you will help this church, that we will remain a missions church, and each member will have a call in their life to preach the gospel daily in their neighborhood, in their community. I pray, God, for the pastor here. I pray, God, that you will bless them. I pray that you'll use them in a mighty way in this congregation. We thank you for your word this morning. We pray, God, that we would have beautiful feet. We would have timely feet taking the gospel to the world. I thank you for your word this morning, Lord. Let it burn into our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.